Brian. I write at gemstate.substack.com. I also write over at declineandfall.blog, occasionally at uh, the National Pulse, and uh, here and there. Uh, thanks for joining me. I just wanted to chat about the happy news today. In case you haven't heard, if you've been living under a rock for the first eight hours of the day, uh, the Supreme Court has overturned Roe v. Wade, as well as the Casey decision that upheld it back in 1992. So that is fantastic news. Um, the decision came down today. It was obviously long rumored after the draft decision was leaked a couple of months ago, and it looks like the draft decision basically held up. There were some additions. Um, the chief justice was not yet committed one way or the other. I suspect that Roberts has spent the last you know, few months trying to sway one of the five justices who wanted to overturn Roe. Uh, in order to narrow the decision. In fact, his concurrence with uh, Justice Alito's opinion uh, is a much more narrow uh, opinion. He wants to he wanted to rule on the actual case, Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health of Mississippi, uh, without making any sweeping changes to Roe or Casey. Now, because that's you know that's who Roberts is. He's kind of a squish. He is concerned mostly for the legitimacy of the court. He wants to keep the court away from controversy. Remember when uh, Obamacare was before the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Roberts essentially rewrote the legislation in order to find a reason to uphold it because he did not want to be in the news as the guy who overturned Obamacare. And he really didn't want his court, the Roberts court, to be in the news as the ones who overturned Roe v. Wade. But... Uh, Justice Alito, Justice uh, Thomas, Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Gorsuch, and Justice Barrett forced his hand, and so he did. Uh, he did join on. The um, I downloaded a copy of the opinion. I haven't read the whole thing. Uh, those things are pretty dry, but they're interesting to see exactly how the justices arrived at the conclusion that they did. But uh, at the very end, in the opinion, Justice Alito writes that abortion presents a moral, a profound moral question. The Constitution does not prohibit the citizens of each state from regulating or prohibiting abortion. Roe and Casey arrogated that authority. We now overrule those decisions and return that authority to the people and their elected representatives. So if you're watching me, then you know uh, that overturning Roe does not legalize uh, or does not make abortion illegal in the entire country. It just returns the issue to the states the way it was before 1973. Uh, prior to 1973, some states banned abortion, some states allowed it. And of the states that allowed it, some of them you know, had different levels on which they allowed it, you know, before 12 weeks or 20 weeks or whatever. And so that's, we're returning to that status quo. Uh, states, you know, the states of, uh, state of Missouri has already banned it. As of this morning, the state of Arkansas will do so in a few hours, I'm told. Uh, here in Idaho, we have a trigger law that will ban it within 30 days. Uh, Florida also has a 30-day trigger law, although uh, their representatives are uh, calling on the governor, DeSantis, to call the legislature back so they can do it now. And why not? So this is good news. It will, um, you know, you'll see blue states... Uh, doing what they can to make abortion more legal and more accessible, unfortunately, but uh, that's the way we are right now. You know, we can't force California or Oregon or Washington or Colorado or New York to uh, bend to our will, at least not yet. You know, maybe if we, you know, maybe there's a chance we can get enough Republicans in the federal Congress who actually have backbones and we might be able to accomplish something. But for now, the battle is now in state legislatures. And, you know, this really is going to go down as one of the great legacies of Donald Trump. And, you know, there's so much uh, recrimination looking back at the 2016 election. Uh, you know, you had the neoconservatives, the ones who told us, you know, the social conservatives, that we had to hold our noses and vote for McCain or Romney or whomever else they were propping up um, because they'd appoint good judges. You, know, you see, the Republican establishment has been using the abortion issue ever since Roe v. Wade, ever since 1973, as a way of keeping us on their plantation. 
you know, the, the neoconservative establishment, the Republican establishment, they never really cared about social issues like abortion or gay marriage. They just used those issues to make sure that we would continue supporting them. And in return, they would get their endless wars and their open borders and their free trade. And so when people like McCain or Romney were nominated, we were told we had to support them because they'd appoint good judges. And in the past, the record of Republicans in appointing judges was always mixed. He always had, um, you know, Reagan, he appointed Scalia, but he also appointed um, Sandra Day O'Connor, who was kind of squishy. And, uh, George H.W. Bush appointed uh, David Souter, who, pretty, who was pretty liberal, but he also appointed Clarence Thomas, who's one of the most conservative judges in history. Uh, George W. Bush appointed Sam Alito, who wrote this opinion today, but he also appointed John Roberts, who has been um, a problem. And so that promise that a Republican president would appoint good judges, it was mixed. However, in 2016, suddenly those same Republican establishment figures were not willing to play the same game with us. We told them, look, you've got to vote for Trump because he'll appoint good judges. And they said, no, they took their ball and went home. You had the never Trump movement, people like Bill Kristol and Jonah Goldberg and uh, David French and, um, you know, so many more. You know, Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, uh, they uh, they refused to support Trump, no matter what judges he promised to appoint. In fact, you had um, uh, Ben Shapiro. Uh, we, uh, uh, I think it was actually the, the first person I saw bring it up was Raheem Kassam. Uh, he brought up a post from Ben Shapiro in t- August of 2016, where he said, um, let's see, I wrote it down here. He said... Oh, I didn't actually quote it. I thought I did. Um, basically, he said that Trump is not going to appoint conservative judges, that this is ridiculous, that he'll uh, he'll appoint liberal judges e- even worse than the ones we already have. And he was very certain about this back in 2016. You see, you know, in the later half of Trump's term, people like Shapiro jumped on the Trump train to try and pretend that they were part of the MAGA movement all along. But they weren't then and they aren't now. Uh, Shapiro's partner at The Daily Wire, Jeremy Boring, who I like on several issues. However, he's uh, he's trying to pretend that he never said some things he said. Uh, back in 2016, he said, um, quote, Reagan and Bush both failed to consistently appoint originalists to the court, and they were actually trying, end quote. So he expected that you know Trump was not going to do this. And now that Trump, you know, his legacy is the overturning of Roe v. Wade because of the three justices he appointed, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, and Amy Coney Barrett, uh, they're all pretending like, oh, we were, you know, we were for this all along. But of course they weren't. Now, I also have to give credit to Mitch McConnell for not um, going along with Obama's nomination of Merrick Garland in 2016. Remember, Antonin Scalia passed away and Obama appointed uh, Merrick Garland of Nevada. And he said that he was a moderate. Obviously, Scalia was a very solid conservative. And so Obama was trying to split the difference by compromising. And that's usually what Republicans do. And this was the first time I really saw Republicans refuse. They, they stood their ground. McConnell refused to even have, it, have any hearings, um, and no matter what the left said. And it was a big gamble, too, because had Hillary Clinton won, she would have withdrawn Garland's nomination and uh, put up some far left uh, you know, crazy person. Uh, so it was a huge gamble, but it paid off because then Trump came in and appointing, appointed Gorsuch instead. Uh, they were trying to pass Garland off as a moderate back then, but look at him now that he is Biden's uh, attorney general. He's obviously a, uh, he obviously would have been awful on the court. You know, he's the one who was going after parents attending school board meetings as domestic terrorists. So he, he, he would have been an awful pick and he would have pushed the court much further to the left. And so thanks to McConnell, thanks to Trump, and no thanks to people like Ben Shapiro or David French, uh, we are at this moment, this moment today, where Roe v. Wade is gone. It is in the history books, along with Plessy v. Ferguson, along with Dred Scott. It's uh, another of those mistakes that the court makes and is fixed later on. Don't forget, too, the uh, the evangelicals who were too sanctimonious to vote for Trump. His mean tweets and his sordid personal life, you know, they, they said he was awful. We cannot support him. And yet here, this is the man who brought about the end of Roe v. Wade. And the moral people that the 
holier than thou evangelicals would have supported. You know, your George W. Bush, um, you know, your Mitt Romney, your uh, you know, your Jeb Bush, or whomever else they would have preferred. Um, those people didn't accomplish it. Not even Reagan, not even Saint Ronald Reagan was able to uh, able to do this, even though Roe v. Wade was still very fresh in everybody's minds during the beginning of his term. Uh, he was elected less than ten years after that decision. No, it took Donald Trump, the New York billionaire, larger than life, bombastic, mean tweets, you know, crass sense of humor, uh, sordid personal life. That's who ended up being the one to appoint the people who tore down this uh, this awful legislation or this awful uh, decision. So people are wondering if there are going to be riots over this, and I'm not sure. I think there will be some demonstrations and maybe a little bit of scattered violence. I don't think it'll reach the same level as 2020. Uh, the abortion issue animates a different group of people than that of race relations or police, you know, alleged police brutality. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be quite as spicy as it was in 2020. However, what I think we are going to see are smaller targeted demonstrations. We've already seen pro-life organizations firebombed and graffitied. I think that's going to increase. There was already the protests at the justices' houses. Uh, somebody was arrested at the um, uh, at uh, Justice Kavanaugh's house with um, weapons. And I th unfortunately, I think that's going to just increase and get worse. Um, you had uh, Maxine Waters today. Remember in 2020, she's the congressman from California. She was telling people to get in our faces. Don't let us go out in public without being harangued. Uh, now she's out there saying to hell with the Supreme Court. We're going to fight this. Uh, you know, if anybody on the right said something like that, it would be called an insurrection. Uh, but that's where we stand now. That's the... Um, that's the level of rhetoric we see, and I think that rhetoric's only going to increase. Um, so if I were Kavanaugh or Barrett or the other justices, I would make sure I have solid security and make sure my family's in an undisclosed location right now. And I think churches and pro-life organizations need to be concerned about this, their security as well. Uh, Rahim Kassam posted a, a piece at National Pulse this morning. He was there at the Supreme Court and saw some of the demonstrators and the protests. And his takeaway was that they're basically demoralized, that they're there, they're screaming, they're angry, but they don't really have any, uh, any direction. And that was the same feeling I got when I went to the pro-abortion rally in Boise last month. Um, I said at the time that it was the last gasps of a culture of death. Uh, because that's what it is. It really is a culture of death. You know, their entire uh, passion over this issue is over wanting to be able to destroy human life for their own convenience. You know, they wrap it up in euphemisms, you know, women's health and all those things. But really, it is about uh, destroying human life. It's sacralizing death. There's a few tweets, I think, that uh, play to this. Uh, Zero HP Lovecraft said, quote, The object-level debate about abortion is honestly less important to me than the symbolic one. Roe is a left-wing idol, and therefore it must be destroyed and defamed. End quote. And I agree with that. Obviously, um, the idea that human life will now be protected, at least in red states, is important um, materially to those human beings who will now have a chance to be born and grow up. Um, but also to the culture that uh, we're promoting. But at the same time, the, you know, he's right that this is a sacrament. This is an idol of the left, and tearing it down is an important cultural victory. Uh, oftentimes, I think we forget that on our side. You know, we just look at policy. We look at uh, you know taxes and regulations, and we forget that the culture war is larger than any of those things. And you know, the culture war is what uh, whose values are going to be promoted and protected in our country. And for too long, I think the left has been setting the tone on that issue. Um, they've been taking the moral high ground, even though, you know, I'd say they don't have any morality, uh, but that's where they've been. And this is a chance for us to now go on the offensive. Uh, another Twitter uh, account named Fisher King says, quote, People who say slippery slope arguments are a fallacy tend to flip out anytime conservatives gain a small victory in the culture war. 
They do this because they are well aware that slippery slope arguments aren't fallacies. End quote. And it's very true. And when, when conservative Christian parents were complaining about um, the gay agenda in the 90s, they were told that you know that was a slippery slope fallacy. When the argument was going on over gay marriage, we were told that was a slippery slope fallacy. Uh, and now we see you know literal grooming of our children and uh, all the things that are going along with that. And it's a reminder that the slippery slope is real. As Dr. James Lindsay has said, it's not only that the slippery slope is real, it's that Marxist activists are, you know, you know, greasing up the slope to make it even slipperier. And that can be the same thing the other way. In his concurrence with the opinion, Justice Clarence Thomas, the most based justice on the court, he uh, suggested that there were other decisions that could be affected by this new direction, this new willingness to go back and review the the basis for some of the past decisions. You know, he, he looked at Obergefell and Griswold and several others where the court of the time of the, uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago uh, went beyond the words of the Constitution to try and read back into the Constitution certain ideas that were then in vogue. And uh, Roe v. Wade was just one example of that. Uh, that nowhere in the Constitution does it say that you a, a woman has the right to go to a doctor and have her unborn child destroyed. But they read into that because it was becoming a popular cultural issue. The, uh, you know, the court in 1973, they took this idea and kind of stuck it in the Constitution saying, well, because the Constitution says that you have the right to be secure in your papers, uh, that implies a right to privacy, which implies that the medical decisions between a woman and her doctor are not subject to government regulation, which implies that abortion should be legal. It's a really tenuous uh, course that they take. And Justice Alito you know, dismantles that in his uh, decision in Dobbs. And Thomas you know, is taking it a step further, saying, well, what other, what other decisions might face the same scrutiny? And so I think that's the slope that we're on. And we as conservatives, as Christians, as Republicans, need to just push it further. We need to keep going in that direction. Now is not the time to hold up and say, okay, well, we won a victory. Let's sit back and relax. No, now is the time to keep pushing. We need to be bold. We need to be aggressive. We need to be on the offense if we're to have any hope of retaking our culture. As I said, this is a state issue now. So each of us needs to turn inward to our own states. We have the opportunity now to create a culture of life here in Idaho, in Texas, in Florida, in all these other red states. Uh, here in Idaho, we have a trigger law, but in my opinion, it doesn't go far enough. It still carves out exceptions for rape, incest, health of the mother. I imagine we're going to start seeing a lot of pro-choice, pro-abortion doctors writing prescriptions saying, you know, this, uh, this woman's health will be impacted if this pregnancy is not terminated. And so we need to go further. I would like to see uh, pregnant women who attempt to get an abortion, I would like to see them prosecuted for that. It's not a popular opinion, but it's, uh, it's the logical opinion. You know, if you um, if you hire a hitman to kill somebody, you're still liable for that murder. And it's the same thing. If you go to a doctor and say, suck out this you know human life that's inside me, uh, you should be liable. Uh, unf unfortunately, I think Republicans are afraid. They, they don't want to touch that because they're afraid they'll push away women. Uh, so they pretend that women are just victims of the abortion lobby. You know, it's, it's almost the same thing that feminists do. Feminists try and twist things around to say that women have no moral agency, that anything wrong a woman does is because there's some man pushing her to it. Whereas, uh, you know, evangelicals and Republicans kind of do the same thing. Women have no moral agency. They're just, uh, they're just manipulated into doing these evil things by, by those evil men, uh, abortion doctors or, you know, boyfriends or husbands or whatever. Uh, but if we're to have equal rights, then we need to have equal responsibilities and equal consequences. Idaho's trigger law in, um, the very last section actually has an explicit exemption for women. It says that nothing in here shall be construed to prosecute um, you know, women who seek to get an abortion. So I think if we're going to be consistent, if we're going to follow our uh, position to its logical conclusion, we need, to, uh, we need to criminalize the act of getting an abortion. If you believe abortion is murder, then shouldn't you prosecute the murderer? I would also like to see... Um, uh, some sort of 
prohibition on crossing state lines to get an abortion. And I recognize that's hard and it's probably not feasible or constitutional at this time. So I'm just spitballing here uh, because we're going to see blue states starting to ramp up their advocacy of abortion. Here in Idaho, we're surrounding, you know, we've got Washington and Oregon on our borders. And I know those states are going to be increasing the availability of abortions. They're going to be advertising here saying that, uh, what, you know, you don't have the right to an abortion here in Idaho. Well, come across state lines and we'll help you out. Uh, I know some corporations are even offering to pay for this for their employees. Uh, you know, when, when a corporation, when a big faceless evil corporation is suddenly offering to do something for you, maybe you should look that gift horse in the mouth. You should ask yourself, why are they willing to do this? Well, it's in big corporations' interests that women kill their babies rather than being pregnant and carrying it to term and then having a baby to take care of. They don't care about you. They just want to you know, a worker drone who isn't going to be distracted by things like babies. So consider that. But I, I would like to see some form of protection for the citizens of red states. Uh, I have no idea how it would work, if there's any feasible way to do it. But I think we're going to start seeing in the next few years some interesting ideas coming up, and we should at least start talking about them. Now, like I said, the time is to be bold. Idaho's trigger law is great. However, it is not what caused this to happen. What caused Roe to be overturned was Mississippi explicitly attacking Roe v. Wade. They, they did not listen to the people who said, you can't pass this law because it's unconstitutional. No, they went ahead and did it anyway and challenged the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled in their favor. That's what we need. That's the kind of boldness we need. You know, here, in, here in Idaho, our leaders are, you know, they're Republicans, but they're not bold enough. You know, uh, Brad Little and Lawrence Wasden, our governor and attorney general, respectively, they made statements about our heartbeat bill this year, saying that they don't think it's constitutional, they don't think it'll pass, they don't think it'll hold up, but we'll sign it anyway. And Wasden's supposed to be defending this thing in court against Planned Parenthood and all their lackeys. Thankfully, he's almost done. He was defeated in his primary by the great Raul Labrador, who will, I am sure, make a much more spirited defense of human life here in our state. But now that Roe v. Wade is gone, they don't have that excuse anymore. They can't say, well, it's not constitutional, so we're not going to do it. Now that, uh, you know, that safety net has been taken away, so now they hopefully have no choice but to be bold. And we need to elect people to our state legislatures who will be bold, who will ban abortion, um, crim you know, criminalize it, and also start taking back our culture on a bunch of other areas, too. You know, start going after these, uh, you know, drag queen pedophiles, start going after the uh, obscenity that's in our schools and libraries, you know, we can take back our culture and make sure that our values are being promoted, not, you know, not our enemy's values. You know, I, I think this is going to drive a division between our states. We're going to see a much greater divide between red America and blue America. Uh, just go on Twitter today and you can see all sorts of maps showing which states are going to ban abortion and which states are going to expand it. And, um, Frankly, this is a debate that should have been had 50 years ago, but the Supreme Court stepped in and prevented us from having that debate. Well, now that uh, that now that that's been removed, we will have this debate, and we will have blue states doubling down on their culture of death, their worship of death. Uh, California and Maryland were already considering ideas that would um, decriminalize after birth abortion, you know, inf literal infanticide. Whereas red states were, you know, we have this opportunity to, you know, ban abortion entirely and become sanctuary states for life. And I think that divide is going to, it's going to become more and more obvious when you see which states are promoting death and which states are promoting life. Um, and it's going to play a part in the continued dissolution of our country. And I, I don't know if we'll continue on for a few more decades, if we're going to have some sort of civil war, if we're going to have some sort of peaceful divorce. Um, I don't know. We live in the end of an empire, and it's extremely unpredictable what's going to happen. But what I can say is that we should do what we can to continue to live our lives, live out our faith, uh, promote our values, and make sure that our communities and our states are sanctuaries for life. And so today is a great day. Let us celebrate. Um, do what is necessary for security if you have a church or a pro-life organization that is in a dangerous area. But this is a happy day. Um, the Attorney General of Texas, Ken Paxton, he uh, 
closed his office and he said he will close his office on uh, June 24th every year from now on as a memorial to the you know, 60 to 70 million unborn children who've been killed since Roe. So today is a wonderful day. Let's uh, praise God and then get to work, you know, because this is just the beginning. I will talk to you later.